Uh, as Noam says, uh, I was um, editor at, uh, at Newsnight at the BBC uh, for about four years be before coming to uh, Google and uh, worked in, t in TV for about uh, 20 years. And that period uh, between 2004 and 2008 was a you know, fantastically exciting period uh, in terms of innovation and, and the digital tools with which we were able to do our job. Um, and at that period, we were, we were experimenting all the time. I mean, every, almost every week we would come into the, into the office and uh, people would say, well, have you seen this new thing? It's called, it's called YouTube or this new thing called Facebook or, or Twitter. And uh, we would very enthusiastically grab hold of it um, and see if we could, um, uh, what we could do with it. And that was a very exciting time. And that, that seems to me is sort of the first, the first golden age of, of great digital tools, and I think we're right in the middle of the, of the second gold, golden age of digital tools at the, at the moment. But before I begin and, and, and launch in with some thoughts uh, on, the, on the future of, of the journalists, I thought I should give you a, a quick word of warning that predictions are always fraught with danger. Um, I remember uh, not long before I, I left Newsnight, uh, there was something very new on the scene, it was called Twitter, and it was... Uh, attracting lots of uh, interest and attention and I made a solemn pledge to, to the, the viewers of, of Newsnight that I would never use Twitter uh, on the programme because I, I, I thought we were a very high mind, we had a very high minded audience uh, and I, I remember blogging, I don't think our audience wants to hear what we've had for breakfast uh, so we won't be using Twitter on uh, Newsnight. So let's fast forward to today and this is the new chief correspondent and presenter uh, of Newsnight, uh, Laura Koonsberg. And I invite you to look at her Twitter uh, number of tweets and followers. 13,000 uh, tweets she has achieved over the years, uh, 105,000 followers. So she is the queen of Twitter. Now, I'm not saying she's the journalist of the future, but I think she gives you a very good indication of where journalism is heading in the, in the very near future. It is about absolutely engaging on a daily basis with, with your viewers and, and listeners in a way that I confess I didn't understand back then. So just before we kick off, I thought it was worth just defining our terms um, with a very simple definition of what a journalist does. The journalist collects, writes and distributes news and other information. Of course everybody in the room knows that. And really what I'm going to try to talk about is how the technology and the technology trends are going to impact upon those three things, the collecting, the writing, and the distribution of information. And first, let's talk a little bit about the equipment. Um, the one on the left, uh, does anyone remember using, using a, a phone like that? Come on, gentlemen. Um, when I started in journalism, um, that telephone uh, was still future technology. So in, in 1990, uh, I joined as a trainee at the BBC, and we didn't have uh, any mobile phones at all. And um, about a year after that, they then came in. And I remember we used to have to make an application in writing to use the one mobile phone that was in the office. So you'd have to say, I've got, I'm doing such an important story that I really, really need this mobile phone to go out and do, do the work. And of course, that was only sort of one illustration of the extraordinary expense and, and uh, the, the uh, equipment that was required to produce television programs. I remember the, the cameraman that I used to work with had a mortgage on his camera. Uh, it was extraordinary because his camera cost £75,000 and he, had, he actually had a mortgage on his camera. When I first went out uh, to do uh, a TV piece, we had a crew of six people. So we had the, we had the producer, we had the, the reporter, we had the cameraman, the sound man, the lighting man, and a PA to take notes. Six people. Unbelievable. Uh, and if you wanted to find out a piece of information, we went along, and I don't know if, if, if any of you, anybody here remembers this uh, from their journalistic days, but we used to go along to a place called News Information, um, and you would talk to your clerk, and you would say, uh, do you have any articles about Israel? And he would open up an envelope and say, here are the articles we have about Israel. And you would go through them, and they were all yellow and curled at the edges, and they'd been cut by hand from a newspaper. And you'd look through them and say, ah, that, that's the article I had in mind. And you would 
have a note, take notes, and go off and do your piece. And that was 25 years ago. So I think it's just worth spending a little bit of time thinking about how, how far we have come in 25 years from the device on the left to the device on the right. And the device on the right, everyone in this room has one. It is now giving us uh, the ability to access all the world's information, but it also gives us the ability to be a news gatherer and uh, a news publisher. So in, in one simple device, we've kind of swept away all of the paraphernalia of the past. And I think there's no better illustration of the power of that device than what happened just a few, a few days ago at the, at the Oscars. Um, Bradley Cooper took his uh, now infamous selfie, um, broke Twitter in the process, and it ended up on the front pages of newspapers uh, all around the world. Now, I think that that uh, episode gives us some very encouraging signs for the future of journalism, but it also gives us some rather worrying signs about the future of journalism, because first of all, Bradley Cooper is not a journalist. Uh, he is just a, an owner of a uh, of a smartphone, uh, as almost everybody is these days. Um, so no, no longer is the ability to capture this information and distribute it the preserve of the journalist, it is the, the preserve of more or less anyone. And the second cautionary note is that it wasn't quite what it appeared to be. Um, it, it turns out that uh, the, 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 the device in question had been supplied to him by, by Samsung, who were doing a lot of advertising around the event, and it was an absolutely extraordinary marketing coup. So a very impressive piece of, uh, of, of broadcasting and, and uh, dissemination of information, uh, but I think some cautionary points for the future of the journalist. So um, what is Google's uh, role in, in all of this? Well, um, our, our job obviously is, is search, and the, the move from the desktop, which we traditionally were very strong in, we, we, we kind of made our our name in desktop search, and um, the move from desktop to mobile, oh, excuse me, I'm losing my voice, to mobile over the last couple of years has been truly astounding. Some of the figures that we're seeing, for example, for uh, YouTube videos, the, uh, the viewing of YouTube videos moving, going from, say, six or seven percent just 12 months ago to around about 50 percent now on mobile devices just a year later. So um, a, a huge change. How is that going to affect the, the journalists of the future in terms of the way that they access information? Well, here's the way Larry Page thinks about it. The perfect search engine would understand exactly what you mean and give you back exactly what you want. So we've come a long way in terms of search, but as you can see from that statement, we're only just getting started. So now I'm going to attempt a quick switch here of device, and we'll do a couple of quick demonstrations to demonstrate what we have in mind when we talk about the future of search on mobile. Who has, who has seen um, Google Now or is using Google Now? A, a reassuringly small number of people. That's, I'm quite surprised because uh, you're a, you're a high-end audience. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, Google Now and, and the way we're thinking about it. So, Clearly, the way that we used to search was that we typed in uh, our queries into the computer. On a mobile device, that's much more difficult. So we're moving very speedily towards uh, voice search. So I'm going to attempt a couple of quick demonstrations about the way we think about voice search, and not just the recognition of speech, but trying to replicate uh, a much more human conversation. So have a look at this. Who is the president of Israel? Got that right. Normally it answers me with a pleasant sounding voice. Let me try again. Who is the president of Israel? Who is the president of Israel? Got it right. But normally it speaks to me. I don't know why it's not speaking to me. Okay. How old is he? There we go. So, oh, volume coming. 
let me just re rewind, shall I? Shall I start again, just for full effect? <laughs> Who is the president of Israel? Shimon Peres is the president of Israel. <laughs> you know my next question. <laughs> That's the following lecture. <laughs> How old is he? Oh. I didn't speak clearly. Who is the president of Israel? Shimon Peres is the president of Israel. <coughs> How old is he? <laughs> How old is he? Where was he born? No, I think we're, we're struggling here. It's probably all, all, all of you with your Wi-Fi in the room that is uh, causing me problems here. Where was he born? No, I'm going to have to move on to my next demonstration here. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was working beautifully in rehearsal, as, as always happens. Um, so, Google Now, uh, so that's voice search. Google Now really is, is the next generation beyond that, uh, and we kind of think of it as, as search without searching at all, uh, moving towards uh, assist and, and suggest. And, and what's happening here is that it's, it's taking a, a range of information based on, on what it knows uh, about my location, uh, information from my calendar, etc., and offering really the the six or seven things that uh, would be useful to, to me today, based on uh, where I am and what I'm doing. So, as you can see, um, I'm three hours from the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, which I might be interested in visiting later on in, the, in, in my trip. Uh, it's offering me Hebrew English translation and the exchange rate. And thankfully, it's 16 degrees here in Herzliya, and just 12 degrees at home. Good. So, what do we think, Paul? Are we going to have a go at uh, a, little a little translation test? Let's, let's try it. Come on. Right. So, imagine I am a, 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 an Israeli journalist, or imagine Paul is an Israeli journalist, and he's abroad. I'm just waiting for my phone to, to light up here. Um, so at the moment, we don't have uh, voice search uh, Hebrew to English, but we have it the other way around. So, uh, so we do have voice search Hebrew to English, but we don't have it in English to English. Yeah. yeah. Right. Here we go. Speech and so I need this track out. Get this track. <laughs> That's extraordinary, isn't it? Amazing. It was working beautifully in rehearsal. <laughs> it's not working now. Oh, here we go. Aim Raita et Afghana, and I hold a giddy Makaraka Nayom. It was terrible. The police started firing. About five people were killed. I'll be honest. I'm going to be completely honest. I'm going to read out. We kept speaking. <laughs> It was terrible. The police kept firing. About five people died. Is 
זה היה נורא. המשטרה התחילה לראות כחמישה אנשים נהרגו. It's uh, slightly difficult in these conditions with everybody using their, their, uh, their phones, but it, you get a sense of, uh, of the way we're heading and sp speech recognition and uh, translate getting better all the time. Okay, now let's switch back to the, the presentation. Um, so a quick word about, about search. Um, I, as you probably know, the Google search trends is actually run right here in, in Israel. So at our, at our office in Israel, uh, we have some of the, of, of the people who are working on search trends globally. And in terms of information useful to journalists, I mean, I think it's, a, it's just a fantastically rich tool. Uh, I don't know how many of you who are operating as journalists are, are using it on, on a daily basis, but I would heartily recommend that you do. In terms of knowing what your readers are interested in, uh, and thereby uh, forming judgments based, based on that, uh, it's a fantastically useful tool. So um, I did a little search before coming here uh, today about, about what uh, Israel has been searching for over the last couple of weeks. And of course, it's not surprising that they've been searching for Ukraine. And you can see the, the two big peaks of the Ukraine story um, as it's unfolded over the weeks. Um, but what you can also do with this is you can compare with other um, subjects and see uh, which ones are, are more popular, more searched for. And um, the next one is a slightly disturbing one as far as uh, Israel is concerned. Um, the beauty queen competition, Miss Israel, I'm afraid, uh, far, far outstrips uh, even Ukraine in terms of, of, of interest. And I think I'm right in saying that the competition took place last week. And actually, if you look at the search trends over the last week, three or four of them actually relate to, to that event. The, the name of the, of the winner of Miss Israel, Be Beauty Queen, and uh, Miss Israel itself were all uh, very, very searched for terms over the, the last week. So now I'm not saying for a second that the, the journalists of the future should, should entirely base their journalistic judgments based uh, uh, on uh, those trends, but it's useful information. It gives you useful ins insights into what people are interested in. I suspect many uh, newspapers here in Israel were running stories both about Ukraine and about uh, Miss Israel over the last week. And of course you can uh, compare trends over time, you can look at the, the, the spikes going back in time, so that, that's going from about 2005 through to today, you see a spike every time the competition happens once a year, and this year for some reason or another, I know not what, uh, it has been very, very successful. Now you might think that's all rather frivolous, but uh, here's an example of a, a, a deadly serious use case for exactly the same technology. So this is Flu Trends, which uh, we've been running at Google for a few years now. And the way that Flu Trends works is it analyzes the search trends for symptoms and remedies for flu. And of course, you search for symptoms and remedies before you go to the doctor. So actually, we can predict when outbreaks are going to happen about two weeks before uh, the medical authorities in the various countries can do so. So you, you see the two lines there on the, on the chart. Uh, one of them is, uh, is uh, CDC data and the other is uh, Google Trends. And you see that it's been very, very accurate uh, over the period. So that's Google Trends. I was going to show you a couple more, uh, slightly more detailed uh, examples of, of tools. I, I, I think uh, Nick and Vanessa were talking in some detail about uh, tools uh, earlier if you went to their uh, workshops. Um, and they, they can answer any more questions that, that come up. But uh, here, here in particular is one I wanted to show you, which is Public Data Explorer. There's huge uh, sets of public data available uh, online that can be uh, analyzed using uh, Public Data Explorer. I'm actually going to dip out of the presentation here for a second just to show you uh, this in reality. So what's happening here is the big blobs on the, on the map represent countries. Uh, and over time, we're seeing what's happening to those countries in terms of uh, the, the, the size of the, of the family, the, the fertility rate of countries, and life expectancy. So uh, we play this little movie, and this is kind of ours of fun, I think. And 
And as a way of engaging readers, rather than simply giving information to them, allowing readers to play with this kind of data visualization, uh, I think it's, it's really extraordinary. So what's going on there? You've got the big blobs, that's China, and there is India. And you can see that over time, they have become richer, their families have become smaller, and they're living longer. Which is quite a good news story. And you can see Israel there bobbing away on the right hand side. There's a period there where it got to almost Shimon Peres levels of. of <laughs> like was, uh, but now, I mean, very, 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 very good score. I think something, something between 80 and 85 years old as the average life expectancy in Israel is pretty, pretty extraordinary. I'll play one more time. This is a quiz question. Can anybody tell me what the very fast moving little country is? Which I'll point out to you in a second, okay? First person gets a round of applause, okay? Look, look out for it. There it goes. Off to the left. Off to the right again. <laughs> Who can name that country? Uh, any, any thoughts? It's, um, I'll tell you one more time. Yeah, uh, so obviously it was, the, it was the killing fields that caused the, the life expectancy to, to, to fall really very, very dramatically during those years uh, back in the, in, the, in the 70s and 80s. Okay, so that's Public Data Explorer. Back to the presentation. And in a similar kind of vein, n-gram, n-gram viewer. And this is something that is, is, is possible to do that simply wasn't possible just a very, very short period of time ago. So this is analyzing the words that appear in all the books that we've stored in, uh, in Google Books. So in this example, uh, I've taken all the books from 1800 through to the year 2000 and uh, looked for this, the terms chivalry versus feminism. And you can sort of test it against your own knowledge of this. You can see that feminism was showing no interest whatsoever until the early years of the 20th century, around right, about 1918 or so, suffragette movement, of course, then climbed over the rest of the century and finally overtook chivalry in the late 1970s. You know, that, and that kind of rings true, but being able to actually analyse the words as they appear in a huge corpus of books, something that simply wasn't possible uh, a very, very short period of time ago. So huge opportunities there for journalists. And of course, as Vanessa was talking about earlier in great detail, the, the best visualisation of all is, is maps. And as a way of engaging readers and keeping them on your pages, uh, there's, there's nothing better than a map, is there? Um, so this is, again, I'm sorry to be morbid about it, but this is about murder rates around the world. Um, and um, again, if you, know, if you write an article talking about uh, which country has the highest murder rate, uh, you might spend a little bit of time on that, but if you, if you visualise it on a map, you can have uh, really hours of, of interesting analysis and, and, and poking around. So again, I, I wasn't aware of this until I looked at this in some, some detail uh, yesterday, but Honduras, in fact, is the, surprisingly, is the, appears to be the murder capital of the world. And in that one frame alone, there's a whole lot of interesting stuff, isn't there? The, the, the United States, for example, the, the murder rate higher than in Cuba, um, whereas in Central, Central America, whereas you might perhaps think of, of, of Latin America or uh, or, or Africa as being more dangerous, uh, Honduras there as, as dangerous as it gets in the world. Okay, so those are, those are a few tools for, for journalists. Uh, and then moving on to, to broadcasting. Um, and as I said at the beginning, the, the extraordinary change that we've seen in recent times is that we've moved from a situation where only a very small number of people could be broadcasters with extremely expensive equipment to a situation where everybody uh, who, who has a computer can now be a broadcaster. Now that's obviously Barack Obama, the most famous uh, hangar uh, of them all, but the ability now to do a, a Google Plus Hangout is really available to, to anybody. And what that gives you is the, the, the opportunity to, to video conference uh, with up to 10 people and then broadcast that live and then once you've made the broadcast to record it and have it uploaded automatically to, to YouTube. So huge opportunities there. And I want to show you a video which 
this isn't, this isn't journalism, but it kind of gives you some ideas of how journalists might use this tool in the future. Where do you see this? Freedom for me has always just been going for a walk in the woods, finding the perfect light and getting a shot. I think I started when I was 12 years old, putting that canoe on my shoulders, carrying it down to the lake and going for a paddle. John Butterell is a good photographer. His epic canoe trip, 1969. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a long time ago. One day, I was out taking pictures and I thought, how cool would it be to attach a phone to your camera and hang out with five, ten people? And they would see exactly what I was seeing through the viewfinder of my camera. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. And uh, the next day, Corey Fisk came into the hangout. I loved Cars for Youth. I have been living with it in the last ten years. And this is my world. There's nothing more to my world than that. I just said, tomorrow I'll take you for a walk. I could walk closer to that old tree over there. Down a little. Okay. More. Right there. Lovely. Look up. Look way up. Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah, I might go that way. Oh. For a few brief minutes, she wasn't going to be in that bed. She was going to experience her own momentary escape. She was on a virtual photo walk. And we didn't even know what one was then. But we were sure doing it. The next day, we posted the video. People saw it and started sharing it. And photographers all over the world jumped on board. So we're bringing lots of people around and people live in Hawaii here. Oh, we have a people. Look at this. Oh, oh my God. Yeah, beautiful cake on the cover of Buffalo. This is a Utah cake. I'll be emailing you for the suit. I never anticipated that so many photographers would give their time and feel so committed. As a photographer, you're in a special place taking pictures. And now people are with you, and for that brief time, you're giving them a little bit of freedom. It's just going to sneak out on idea. It's a very rewarding thing. <laughs> Can you guys see what I'm seeing at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you can, you can very quickly see the kind of uses that could, that could be put to for uh, journalists. Uh, imagine doing something like that live from Syria or live from the World Cup, for example. And that, that, that oh, is now. Uh, sorry? The World Cup? <laughs> it's, it's a possibility. I, I think you might, you might get into trouble if you do it at the games, but imagine if you did it outside the stadium. Uh, so uh, the, the, the opportunity is there, uh, I think, not too far away from us. And of course, the, 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 the great thing now about uh, posting the news is that you get a huge amount of analytics and insight into uh, who uh, is watching them. So there's this. Uh, Slight, uh, I'm not showing this to promote my own video, but this is one of my own videos. I, I specialise in, in headless guitar playing. And the reason I'm showing it to you is not, not to promote it, but to, to demonstrate the, the analytics that lie underneath uh, when you have your own account. So you can tell with you know, a huge amount of detail who is watching your video around the world. Uh, that uh, happens to be a, a video from the, uh, or a, a tune from the Pulp Fiction film, uh, and it's the, the viewers are 90% male, coming from the United States, Germany, and the United Kingdom. So you get, you get a pretty clear impression of the kind of fan uh, of, of my uh, guitar video there. But imagine if you were, if, if you were a journalist or a, making a television program, or you were a band uh, planning to do a tour, you can put your videos up on YouTube and get a very, very clear picture of who and, and, and where they're being watched. Okay, just before I, uh, I pass over to, to know, just some quick thoughts on where we're heading next. I think no one's going to go into, into much more detail about the, the future of, of, of AI and robotics as it might uh, lend itself to, to journalism. But just a few quick thoughts on uh, what to expect in the, the coming years. As I mentioned, you know, the, the internet is, is not yet ubiquitous. Um, we have about 2.5 billion people online at the moment. 
but there's still five billion people in the world not online, and it's those five billion that journalists are often very interested in. It could be in disaster zones, or it could be in remote parts of the world where terrible things are, are going on. So how do journalists uh, get and report those places uh, in, in real time? Well, what we're trying to do, and we're trying to do with, through this uh, extraordinary project called Project Loon, is to, is to float balloons on the edge of space, right up in the stratosphere, which will offer uh, Wi-Fi coverage to remote parts of the Earth or parts of the Earth where uh, we've, we've seen natural disasters to, to bring connectivity to those other five billion. So that's obviously going to open up a huge opportunity for journalism in the years ahead. Moore's law is set to continue. I'm not no one perhaps talking in a little bit more detail about uh, how long it's going to continue for, but. Uh, Moore's law is that the, the, the observation that the, uh, the, the number of transistors you can get on a chip uh, halves roughly every two years, making devices smaller and cheaper. Um, and that, I think, is set to continue for several more years, probably until uh, around about. It's, it's getting to a glass ceiling, so it can't go on forever, but it's certainly expected to carry on uh, probably to, to 2020 uh, at least. And so, what does that mean? Well, it means more devices like this. So uh, we're seeing it already, and those devices are set to get smaller and, and ever more powerful. Um, I already, Google Glass is being used in journalism. We spotted this story of a guy from Vice um, News who used it in, in Turkey. We had, right, you've got one there. Hello, how are you doing? We, we had, um, uh, riot police on the street. He, he didn't want to carry a camera. He, he didn't want to, to be seen. Instead, he put on a, a woolly hat and put a uh, Google Glass underneath and shot a whole lot of video from the riots in, in Turkey. So, already being used as a, as a potential device. And again, just, just before I finish, one more quick film to show you some of the possibilities that lie ahead of us for journalists. Okay, Glass, record a video. This is it. We're on in two minutes. Okay, Glass, hang out with the flying club. Google photos of tiger heads. You ready? You ready? Right there. Okay, Glass, take a picture. So I'll pause it there, but you get the idea of, of the possibilities that, that lie ahead. And again, all, all of the kind of functionality that I was showing you, uh, more or less successfully showing you, of voice search, etc., now trans transported into uh, a wearable device. So we're not typing commands or, or, or searching on computers anymore. So that's really where I will conclude. Um, uh, what Vanessa and Nick have been talking about all of the, the, the tools and ideas that we've been talking about today, uh, you, you can find uh, in-depth detail about them uh, on this site. But just before I go, I was going to just leave you with one thought, um, which actually occurred to me reading about the Crimea conflict earlier this week. Um, the, the first Crimean War, uh, back in the middle of the 19th century, was actually the, uh, a war where technology played a huge part uh, and transformed journalism of those days. It was, it was the future journalism uh, of that era, and that's uh, William Howard Russell. He was the famous Times correspondent uh, who used the, the telegraph for the first time with, with uh, underwater cables to be able to report uh, what was going on in the, in the first Crimea conflict. Uh, and he was able to get his stories back to London within about 24 hours uh, of, of them happening. Um, but there's a, again, there's a cautionary tale in this one because he famously reported on the, the charge of the Light Brigade, uh, which led to the famous Tennyson poem about the charge of the Light, light Brigade. But he got his facts wrong. 
Um, so uh, the story was inaccurate. Uh, the poem was picked up from the story, and therefore the, the famous poem is actually based on historically inaccurate uh, information. So in, in all of this, the tools are incredibly powerful and can help uh, in all kinds of ways in terms of disseminating uh, news. But what's really, really important is that you need to get your facts right in the beginning. And I was talking to, a, to some Danish journalists last week about precisely these issues. And they were, you know, a lot of journalists were absolutely at the cutting edge of digital platforms. And they said, you know, in the end, a lot has changed, but a lot has stayed the, the same. And just as the internet is uh, kind of controversial in some circles uh, today, so the uh, telegraph was controversial uh, back then. Uh, it opened up the war, it allowed embedded war reporting that had never been allowed before. And here's a quote from one of the generals who was involved at the time. The confounded telegraph has ruined everything. Thank you very much indeed. What did you want to do? Do you want to do some questions or do... No. Keep my glasses on in that case. Uh, any questions or observations? You said you, you said earlier that you were you teach the future of journalism. So just just what I was saying match with what you said, or, or something completely different. I just thought that it was interesting that uh, uh, everything made a lot of, of sense, and I, I thought showed the future very well, except for the first definition of journalism, which was which you took from Wikipedia, which you said, um, which uh, wrote uh, to collect, write, and distribute. And it's really not about writing anymore. It's about um, tweeting and broadcasting and YouTubing and, and Google Glassing. And so I think the, the Wikipedia definition should probably be updated oh, to um, you know a word that, that collectively um, uh, gathers all these uh, yeah. all these uh, I, I, actions. And I think also worth saying that, that increasingly writing will mean writing code. Right. Um, so I think the the, the skills of, of the journalists are, are it's no longer enough just to do video or, or text. It, it's got to much more of a, uh, a global experience than that, of course, means coding. Yeah. Sure, I mean, I, I, think, I, I think it's a double edged sword, isn't it? The, the, the ability to, um, to access information is obviously vastly increased. But that also leads to the ability to disseminate inaccurate information, and we, we've all seen conspiracy theories and, and so on uh, proliferate on the on the internet. I think on the on the more positive side, the the uh, ability to scrutinise those in power and, and to scrutinise people who are peddling untruths has never been greater. And I, I think we, we see this all the time that that when people try to get away with inaccurate information or pull the wool over people's eyes, uh, there there are many many eyes out there who are willing to hold them to account. So I think there's, there's po positive points of view in, in that sense. And how do you talking to I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean by that, but um, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't quite follow your thought, but let, let me pick up from this gentleman. Yeah, Google is all over the world, mm -hmm. and, but uh, there are probably places where Google and Facebook, we know, are not uh, accepted or have their terms. How do you, how do you uh, blend your desire to get all this information out to the world, and when you're in countries with repressive governments. What's the, yeah. how, is it, how is Google working with all of that? Yeah, well, I mean, we just believe that, that free flows of information and, and access to information is a good thing. Um, and we've argued that many, many times. And if you look around the world, you see that countries where you have um, more access to information uh, and free flows of information, those economies are stronger and those societies are stronger. So we, we think... That, that's a big thing. But of course there are, there are many governments around the world who, who see access to information as dangerous. And we've, we have had run-ins with, with, with several of them. We're obviously obliged to uh, abide by the laws of the community that we operate in. Um, but if, it's, if, if, for example, what happened to in, in China was that we, we were in China 
and at that point we were uh, we were prepared to follow the rules of the Chinese government, but it, it, they threw all kinds of obstacles in the, in the way of opening up the internet. Uh, they, we, we found that our systems were being hacked. As a result, we then decided to, to take a different approach to China and offer search unfiltered from, from Hong Kong. So it's, it's a constant battle, but certainly we, we strongly believe that free flowing information is a good thing. Sir? I have two questions. What is your strategy regarding China, following up what you said? Is that to uh, make the Chinese get Google at the end? Uh, this is my first question, in the or to give up. In the second question, how do you explain the failure of Google Plus? Ah, well, there's two, two very different questions. <laughs> let, me, let me start with the second one, shall I? Uh, we, we, we certainly wouldn't see uh, Google Plus as in any way a, a failure. The take up in a very short period of time has been really huge. And bear, bear in mind that, that Google Plus Hangouts there, which we, we showed you, that's, that's part of uh, of Google Plus and has been greatly successful and has been used by news organisations and, and others all around the world. So certainly wouldn't uh, accept, I uh, certainly dispute the, the, the suggestion that it would have been successful. Um, all, going back to the, the approach to, 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 to China, I, mean, our, I think, I think it's, it's much more about our view of, of, of the internet and the web. We, 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 we think, we strongly believe that people around the world should have, should have access to, to the web. But it is also true that in some countries it, it, it simply isn't possible to, to, to operate uh, under the, the rules that are required by the government. So we, we hope in due course that people in the countries will be, be exposed to the web, uh, but uh, we're, we're at some of the crossroads as regards some countries at the moment. Sir? When you think about the claim that uh, Google really forces their users to start using Google Plus, and it's very hard to not, you know, many things that were, that existed pre Google Plus, like Google uh, Plus, aren't even usable to uh, block Google Plus. Yeah, actually, that kind of flows on from the question you asked of them. You know, we, we don't see Google Plus as as a separate service, and increasingly, if you look at the way that, that, that people are, are using all the services, or indeed, as I showed you there, Google Now, the, the, the idea is, is to bring together the suite of, of services that we offer into one easy to use and, and seamless service, which uses a whole lot of different, different aspects. So that, that's the way that we are going. I know there's, there obviously has been some controversy, some of the about some of the things that, that we that we've done in that area. But the idea is to move towards a, a, a holistic service. Sir? I have a question about Google. Can you ask Google Glass to put the position in this way? <laughs> it's not switched on at the moment. <laughs> I'm only wearing it for effect. <laughs> but yes, I will. I'll get back to you on that one. Thank you. Um, sir? Uh, Google has been made a series of acquisitions recently and previously that made people wonder why Google does things the way it does, like acquiring uh, uh, companies uh, that uh, are engaged with robotics, nanotechnology, health, NIST, for example. Yep. Yeah. So. yeah, well, it's, we, you're right. Uh, we, we've acquired a lot of companies in this area. Uh, robotics and, and AI in particular have been the ones that have attracted the most uh, attention. But the, the way to think about it is, it's, there's kind of a continuum of, of all the things that we've been doing over the years. And the, the core to all the services that Google develops is, can you uh, develop services that are very useful to people, that, 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 that make a big difference in terms of usefulness to people, that are simple to use and in, in improve people's daily lives. And if you look at the trends as we, uh, as we move ahead, we, AI, machine learning, again, some of the things I've showed you with Google Now, I've translated and so on. We're constantly working to make, to make search and translation more intelligent. So, so that's, uh, I, I was talking the other day to, to Dimitri Hassabis, the guy who behind DeepMind, which is a wonderful London-based artificial intelligence company, and he's going to work on search. And it's about bringing artificial intelligence to make search more sophisticated. Um, the other big trend is, is the internet of, of things, the, 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 the fact that, that so many more devices will be connected in the years ahead. So at the moment we have around the world about, about eight 
8 billion devices connected to the internet, and that's due to go to 80 billion in the next short period of, of time. So we're going to see a world in which there are all kinds of possibilities for, for really good services. So for example, if, 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 if my phone knows that I've moved away from, from my house, uh, that I'm nowhere near my, my home, my thermostat at home can automatically say, well, look, he's not, he's not due home anytime soon. I'm going to turn down the, the energy and, and, and save energy. So uh, that's the best way to see the acquisitions. It's all about providing ever, ever more useful uh, tools and services uh, to help people in their everyday lives. Sir? I think that we, we all uh, use Google, but um, from what I've seen this, from this morning, and from what I know, I think that Google is a powerful tool, not only to, to, to gather useful information, but also not useful information. What is the, the Google policy regarding the privacy of, of the individual, of, of, the, of the sole person, who don't want that his information would be um, exposed to, to everyone? Yeah, so I mean, privacy is, is a big issue, and the, the, the truth is that D data is the, is the currency of, of our age. You know, almost everything we do these days leaves a data trail in, in one way or another. And we at Google think that, that data can be used in lots of extraordinarily helpful ways, but we have a, a huge responsibility to, to handle people's data properly uh, and not to abuse it, not to, 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 to uh, compromise uh, data security, for example. So the, 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 the point about all of this is that the only thing that we have is users' trust. So there's, n there's nothing to force you to, to use Google tomorrow. Um, uh, the people only come back to Google because they, they know that it works and they trust it They trust it to work and they trust uh, that the, the data isn't going to be used. But that's what keeps us very straight because if we ever abuse that trust, uh, then people would, would quickly move away to, to other services. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you very much indeed.